ancestors. And the rising of the smoke is our love for you. The greatest prayer we can make is that of thanks. Thanks for the peace there is in this world. Thanks for the peace in our hearts where it exists. And may it flourish and grow through our community this morning, through this call. May we find the peace in the world and cultivate it that the people in Ukraine and other war-torn areas could find rest, nurturance, and hope again. We give thanks for these great gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and love and the community to grow it in. Chakra. Ah, mama, ua noma, amen. Thank you, Apila. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you on this Sunday in December as we bring 2022 to a close and we look forward to next year uh, when we gather again uh, in Chartres. Yesterday, we had a marvelous uh, closing of our final course that we offered for the year at uh, Ubiquity University on the adoration of Aphrodite. Uh, as you all know, uh, this year, because we studied the third of the liberal arts, Rhetorica, uh, which is about the embodiment of love and <clears throat> rhetoric and the spirit of the planet Venus and the goddess Aphrodite. We've been spending a lot of time just in adoration of Aphrodite. And that's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, tonality to meditate upon. We've been doing the 5.5 breathing because the number five is associated with the planet Venus and Aphrodite and uh, the divine feminine and cultures around the world. So as we breathe together in Chartres to uh, that coherent breathing, uh, we were breathing in and breathing out the mother. And that has really been, uh, for me personally, and I think for us as a community, a wonderful meditation. Uh, today, uh, we want to look forward uh, to our next gathering, which will be next July. Uh, second through eighth, uh, with a post Chartres pilgrimage, the ninth through the uh, 15th, which we'll be talking about uh, in our program. But I wanted, as we open today, just to remind ourselves of the Chartres Academy uh, and why we go to Chartres and why we spend time studying the uh, liberal arts, uh, because this is at the heart of Ubiquity University the Chartres framework. It's at the heart of our annual calendar uh, where we every year make pilgrimage uh, to that sacred place and have been doing so uh, since uh, 2005 when I came into the university as president and we've been doing it uh, once a year uh, since then uh, with the exception of uh, 20, 20 and 2021, uh, which when because of the pandemic, we weren't able to go. So we had virtual pilgrimages. As you may remember from your history, uh, the Chartres Academy that built the extraordinary masterpiece of Chartres Cathedral was built in the spirit of Plato's Academy. Fulbert, who was the initiator of the Chartres Academy in 1008, just about a thousand years ago, uh, carried uh, the Timaeus by Plato uh, under his arm as he became bishop. And it was upon that illumination that the Chartres Academy was built and Chartres Cathedral uh, was also built. So we have a lineage back to Plato. And it was Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle that devised the seven liberal arts, probably the most extraordinary learning system ever devised by the human mind. And that's why liberal arts education 
uh, is now a global phenomenon. Uh, because of the enlightenment, it's been stripped away of its sacred components. But what we do every year in Chartres, we take one of the liberal arts in the spirit of the Chartrean masters and in the spirit of the ancient masters. And we seek to illuminate the sacred dimension uh, of that particular art. Uh, so next year, we move from Rhetorica, the third, to Musica, the fourth liberal art. And Musica is the central liberal art. There's three before it, and there are three afterward, after it. But Musica is at the center of the seven liberal arts. And that's very important for us to note as we contemplate what we're going to be talking about today uh, and uh, the preparation in which we need to engage individually and collectively as we move into the next year and meet again uh, in that uh, sanctum sanctorum of our lives. Each of the liberal arts has a planet and a personage that's associated with it that bring a tonality. And just like Rhetorica was under the aegis of the planet Venus, and the goddess Aphrodite, so Musica is under the aegis of the sun and the philosopher Pythagoras. It was Pythagoras, as I've said a number of times uh, on these calls, but just to remind us uh, who could sit so silently that he could actually hear the sounds being made as the different planets whirled through space. It's extraordinary to sit that quietly. And it was through his understanding of the octaves and music and the chords that he discerned probably the most important illumination, certainly in Western civilization and upon which Western civilization is built. And that is that the universe is rationally knowable. No one had conceived that thought before. And just to give you a sense of the illumination, we all know the Buddha. And the Buddha, as he sat in quietude, said that all is emptiness. Nothing is separate. And that was true. Pythagoras was a contemporary of the Buddha. They both lived at the same time. There's some speculation that they even met because Pythagoras went to India as a matter of the historical record. But when Pythagoras sat in silence, under the tree and went into the emptiness, he discerned numbers and geometric shapes and sounds. And his assertion was that it's possible to to enter into the cosmic order and discern the mathematics, the geometry, and the sound. And when he contemplated the sun, he said that the sun emanated what he called the music of the spheres. And the music of the spheres permeated through our entire solar system and beyond and kept the entire planetary orbits in order, in a harmonic. So the basic tonality of musica is, the, is what we're calling waves of love, the healing music of the spheres. And we're gonna be going very deeply into the meaning of the sun. And in my morning nuggets, I'm going to be 
uh, talking about uh, the insights and life and traditions around Pythagoras. I'm very, very, very excited to do so. Uh, and so uh, each year, uh, we have a major faculty that leads us into the depths of the sacred mysteries of our particular liberal art. Last year, as you know, we had V uh, and uh, Andrew, uh, who are our main faculties. And this next year, we are very honored and, and in fact, uh, privileged to have Chloe Goodchild uh, with us. Uh, and to introduce her, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Banav Shea, uh, who has been liaising um, with her, with Andrew. This was Andrew Harvey's suggestion that we go with, uh, with Chloe. Uh, and so we've been spending time getting to know one another. Uh, so Chloe's going to tell us a little bit about uh, her work and her love of musica and uh, the naked voice and other things that she's been developing over decades now. Uh, but Bonafche, welcome, and I uh, uh, turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Jim. Hello, everyone. Uh, so The Waves of Love um, is the title of our um, gathering in Chart next year, also because the liberal art of music corresponds to the heart, in the heart, the heart being the central chakra that bridges the lower and the higher chakras. But to speak about Chloe, Chloe Goodchild is, is not a stranger to this community. She's uh, very well loved uh, in this community, and we look so forward to um, having her with us in Chart next year. But for those of you who don't know her, Chloe is an international singer. She's a teacher, songwriter, and founder of The Naked Voice, which is a pioneering experiential vocal training program that she founded, founded in 1990 to share and teach voice as a spiritual practice. Um, your voice, she says, is as unique as your fingerprint or your DNA. So, Chloe, please tell us about the core elements of the naked voice and what we can look forward to in Chart next year with you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Banafshe. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, and Jim, I'm just really excited by what you've just been delivering there. Very, very excited. I'm very honored to be um, collaborating with you uh, in this coming year, I, I just can already feel what an exciting journey this is going to be. Um, and I love this connection between Pythagoras and Buddha also because uh, my own East West, uh, re my relationship with East and West has been very strong, very, very strong indeed. And um, so the naked voice, where do we start? Uh, maybe just, uh, I can't see everybody, but I think if we just, uh, I, I just allow yourself just to take a big breath and to just relax everything. And I'd just like to invite you, first of all, to ask you, just close your eyes for a moment, actually, and to ask yourself, uh, how you feel about your voice, your voice, what that, what's the immediate response from within to that question. Uh, and, you know, how do you feel about your voice as you have lived it uh, over the last uh, few decades? And uh, how does it live in the solar plexus? And how does it live in the center of the chest? And how does it live in the pineal up in the third eye? So just take a big breath and just join those three power centers for yourself. Just really embody your awareness in your whole self, in your whole body, heart and mind. And just take this breath of yours just keep just drawing it in and just taking it down as you breathe out, just breathing right down into your feet. And then on a thousand miles down into the earth. 
and just find yourself smiling smiling at any thoughts be they limiting or uh, expansive or nervous or apprehensive whatever they may be just breathe them away and just bring your awareness right down into the earth into the living earth I'll just find yourself smiling and just bringing your full awareness into this present moment. And you may just hear a sound uh, coming into this field. And I just like to invite you to join it. Just take a big breath and just hum into how you can hear that sound. Just join it anywhere without any effort at all. waves of love that can ride out on the human voice and just taking the words how I love you and just directing the, that phrase how I love you at your own self with a capital S. song disappear inside you. And if you feel to, to simply place your hands over the heart chakra, center of the chest, and just to be aware of that wave of love that you are that we are as one, one unchanging sound. The world, just like our bodies, is a living being. And everything in this planet in this Gaia, Mother Earth, Ma, Matrix, Ma, Earth, is vibration. And in the ancient world, of course, the Nada Brahma, the 
nada, the unstruck sound, the unstruck sound is the absolute source of pure consciousness. And it was really in the East that I discovered the naked voice. And I discovered it by walking from my uh, Indian vocal teacher, my classical Indian vo vocal teacher from those lessons across the street to sit with non-dual masters. And that kind of the alchemy that started happening between this singing system based on what I came to call the octave of consciousness. Uh, uh, which obviously comes very much and is very resonant, of course, with the Py Pythagorean understanding. I realized that this non-dual teaching and this experience of the voice as the unstruck sound, the unstruck sound that is at the source of consciousness and which the voice itself gives expression to was what I was here on this planet to uh, explore, to research myself, to embody, and then to share with others. And that involved a story which just took me from uh, deafness in early childhood. I'd had traumatic surgery on my ears and so I literally experienced silence for between the ages of four and seven. So that experience of the unstruck sound as a child uh, was, it was a strange um, gift, if you like, a fierce but strange gift that I was given as a child. So I could barely hear what was happening on the outside of me. So what happened was I had to just return my awareness and focus my awareness on my interior life as a child. And so the senses, the elements, the wind, nature herself, the heat of the sun, the water, uh, the earth, sand, birds. Interesting, the frequency of birds I could hear just and i remember having incredible conversations with birds as a kid they seem to we seem to get each other you know um and then slowly the hearing came back and so i was a, in many ways quite a self-conscious and awkward child because i had to make this bridge back into the social world and into everyday life and it was through my experience of sound that that was possible. And it was possible because somehow or other that early childhood experience had birthed a fascination and a very, very sensitive ear to sound itself. And so along with playing the clarinet and the piano, I found myself just sinking and just endlessly uh, joining these choirs, choral fields, uh, and wherever I could to hear the if you like the symphony of consciousness that i'd heard as a child but hadn't been conscious of at that time if you like suddenly i could hear that on the outside as this these choral fields of sound and so i was very lucky i was very privileged because uh, even though i went to this very academic school and i wasn't a particularly intellectual person somehow or other god almighty managed to move my pen across the page of um pieces of paper and exam systems and um i found myself going to cambridge and studying music and education there and i took myself into that uh very refined again very privileged academic environment but nevertheless again really incredible uh music of all kinds could i find there and I found myself singing in these choirs, in these university choirs that were just like in these incredible um, ancient medieval colleges uh, with these, as with Chartres, this incredible uplift. 
So what was happening was the sound in my body through the whole Western repertoire of sacred music, nevertheless, with this richness of experience, it was constantly, my experience of it was that it was lifting me off the floor the whole time. <laughs> I wasn't really fully grounding myself in it. And so I was literally uh, in this kind of elevated, you know, heavenward bound uh, relationship. And the earth hardly existed. And so I had to take my body to Africa, to India. And it was really, and in these more indigenous cultures where the connection with sound was not was still remembered as the earth, as Mother Earth and her being, this primordial awareness of the sacred feminine. And so it was in through Indian uh, vocal philosophy and the spiritual philosophy of India, and then later returning to Greece, actually, that I could hear and then later again still in the indigenous cultures of northern montana the blackfeet always there was this recurring unchanging sound element that was present that grounded me that enabled me finally to really embody my awareness uh, in my feet uh, slowly but surely it took quite a while i can tell you so then what happened was I then found myself with a remarkable teacher of uh, non-duality in the lineage of Ramana Maharshi. At that time, he was called Harilal Punjaji in India. He was a civil engineer. You would have no idea uh, on literally on first meeting just how powerful spiritually this teacher was. And it was really my connection with him. He came to be called Papaji. He was in the lineage of Ramana Maharshi and he'd been a direct disciple of Ramana Maharshi. And I was very lucky to spend some very concentrated time with him uh, on this, literally embodying this awareness of the unstruck sound and of the one unchanging self that exists in that unchanging note and so it was the dialogues with him that slowly and surely just disappeared my egoic mind altogether for several months and I returned to England in a very elevated, very blissed out space with a very powerful experience of the universe as this interconnected reality. <laughs> but, and, you know, I wasn't grounded. Nevertheless, I just felt this insatiable call to sing, 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 and sing myself back home. And so it was really this uh, alchemy of Indian philosophy based on this understanding of the seven swaras of the, what we now call the octave of consciousness. Sa
noticing is how I love you coming down this octave of consciousness. Let's imagine ourselves right now in Chartres Cathedral, singing right up into the upper echelons, into the Great Mother. So it was thanks to music, musica, that I was able to restore and embody myself on the planet, albeit with a very new perspective of the nature of love. So when I just uh, felt uh, Jim and Banefshe and your beautiful community moving towards this understanding of the waves of love as music is the waves of love. I thought, oh my God, I'm in the right place. Very, very blessed to be here with you. And there's much more to share. <laughs> but each of those seven intervals, if you like, are names of love. So just to complete, Sa, the root chakra, I am the source of love, Re, the second chakra, I am sexual creative love, I'm Aphrodite, almighty, the second chakra, Ga, I will instu instinctual love, fire of love, solar plexus love, Ma, mother love, she who is mighty Ma, Ananda Mai Ma, Mary Maria, heart love, devotional empathic love, the heart center Pa, the throat center, all inclusive love the throat center, the cross, the golden cross of love, the meeting of the horizontal and the vertical. Da, the pineal gland, the third eye, mystical love, mystica, musica, mystica. I surrender, I serve. realms of love within oneself, we return to the source of love and to beloved Banafshe. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Chloe. Wow, how beautiful. And what a beautiful reminder that uh, we are love. We are love. Each chakra has a different manifestation of love, a different expression. And it's so beautiful the the way your music, your singing, your playing was was really coming out of silence and bringing such a such a peace. So thank you. Really look forward to having you in Chart with us. Me it, too. Thank you, you so much. You're such a blessing. You're such a blessing in what you carry and what you teach. Me too. I would like to know if people have questions for, for our beloved Chloe. I have a question, Banafshe, if I may. Chloe, I'm just, I, I'm just dazzled by uh, this notion of the seven octaves of love, of the seven chakras. And that's really important to us because a number of years ago, uh, it was actually Banafshe that came up with the, what we call the Chartrian framework, that 
you know, we have the seven liberal arts. We've overlaid them with the seven chakras and the seven colors of the rainbow. And that's the framework for our pedagogy uh, at uh ubiquity university and the wisdom school and but the seven liberal arts uh uh are the the heart of it and so the, to hear you talk about the seven octaves of love you know the sevens are such a powerful organizing uh principle and would love to have you just share a little bit more about your appreciation of the relationship between sound and the chakras and the oh. healing that can take place Bless you. Thank you so much. Well, it's such a great question uh, because really, uh, in fact, I was you know, I was on Crete. In fact, when I learnt the um, those seven seed chakra sounds, and it was actually also in Crete that I had these started having these extraordinary dreams of the Great Mother, way back in the mid nineteen eighties, uh, and um, so it was really the connection with this uh direct collision with the uh the mother the sacred mother uh the mother as earth in all her forms uh and of course india in all the archetypal forms of the mother as we know obviously in the pythagorean and the greek understanding there are all these incredible archetypal um expressions of the sacred feminine and um so when I came back from India, basically, I was so high, uh, but so ungrounded <laughs> that India I will do that to you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's for sure. I tell you, it's like help. <laughs> that I realized um, that I needed serious help. I was very blessed at that time to meet, as some of you will know, Irina Tweedy, uh, the great uh, teacher who's, uh, she also was out in India a period of time uh, in her 50s after her husband died. I was, she was a, this great Sufi teacher that lived in London at that time. And um, it was her connection uh, that really uh, helped me to start really investigating this, what was happening in my body energetically, uh, because the awareness was so all encompassing that I, my ears had become so attuned to absolutely everything that even just walking down the street, there would be no <laughs> separation between myself and a conversation happening with a stranger, you know. Um, so um, I would find that there was this extraordinary sense of the, um, multifaceted nature of sound itself mm -hmm. from its uh, source in silence into spoken language, obviously into poetic expression, and then on slowly into the sung voice. And then discovering, oh my God, why did we ever make sound, you know, speaking and singing, why did we may ever make them separate realities, you know? And uh, because I could hear there wasn't any separation. I kept on hearing people say to me, oh, I haven't got a voice, you know, no, no, I can't sing. You know, she'd go, well, how does that follow? Um, okay, so then I realized we live in this very wounded um, humanity where literally 80% of people, more research that we did, I used to stand in shopping centers and uh, sing there at the bottom of escalators and then i would have a clipboard at the bottom of the escalator and i would ask people how do you feel about your voice and literally that's why i've got the 80 percent thing 88 out of 10 people would say i haven't got one i haven't got a voice and you'd go well who's speaking now you know so then the whole issue of this painstaking kind of uh, experience that particularly in England, you know, in this very colonially driven, dominated culture where speaking has just dominated, uh, you know, as a force of power over people, singing just disappeared into the bardic realm. It's coming back again now, I'm glad to say, through poetry and this massive, uh, you know, return of poetry collectively. Um, so to answer your question, what happened was I realized I had to 
just keep returning to silence. And it and what I started noticing was the energy in the body was so powerful that I kept on being literally thrown off the floor. <laughs> So I would, I started realizing, okay, so the energy is coming from the ground. It's throwing me off the floor. It's throwing me up. So, you know, anything like attention to the wind or attention to rain or attention to elemental energy. It wasn't until I started singing the seven chakras that everything calmed down. Mm. And the uh, this awareness of the up and out, the etheric identification the whole time, started returning also down into the root chakra. The only thing I could think of to do was to sing myself back to a fully integrated relationship with all the three power centers in the body, the three will centers in the body, the solar plexus, the heart and the pineal centers, all of that just suddenly became so obvious. <laughs> it's like, so by the grace of God, this these connections with these sounds and they were not do re mi, although they could be, but I think I have some kind of terror of Julie Andrews, but um, this actual <laughs> The, these sacred mantric sounds, you know, the Sari Gama Padanisa, also the Lam, Vam, Ram, Yam, Ham, Om, Soham, which are now everywhere. You mm. know, everyone, it's, it's almost like a household practice now. Mm. But mm. at that time, I didn't know anyone that was, was singing that. Uh, and so, but I realized, oh, thank God Almighty. So that was accompanied by one of one of these concerts where I was singing in Bath. This beautiful Japanese martial artist came up to me at the end uh, of the concert and he said, hello, <laughs> bowed. And he said, uh, out of nowhere, he just said, oh, I think I can see what you are doing. And I was like, oh, thank God, <laughs> another act of grace. And um, so he said, you're sending your energy too far out there, even still. He said, and all the people, they're going, where has she gone? You see? And he said, I will bring you down, bring you down, bring you down. So that was my next helping hand. Mm -hmm. And we spent 25 years together working on his form, which is Shin Taido, New Body Way working with these different power centers and with the um, energy movement. So I just cannot wait to explore how that relates yes. with Manefshes as well. Um, yes. But it's my gratitude to Masashi Minagawa, uh, Master, that we then created what we came to call the seven sounds of love. So that is just blows my mind that this, all these sevens are multiplying here. Yeah. This is going to be wonderful, Chloe. I can hardly wait. Uh, this is just a little taster, everyone, of, <laughs> of the deep mysteries that are in store as we explore uh, the seven sounds of love and the seven chakras within the heart center of the seven liberal arts. It's going to be an extraordinary uh, session. So, Chloe, thank you. Um, and I want to just turn everyone to something that's very exciting for next year. It's something that we've we've tried before, but not successfully. But we have a feeling that uh, Chloe and everybody is going to be bringing such good energy that um, we want to develop a Charter for Youth program and really do it in a very conscious way. Mm -hmm. And the impulse for that has come from one of our pilgrims and and colleagues. Uh, at the University and Humanity Rising, uh, Paula Petrie, uh, who uh, was there uh, for Rhetorica and uh, approached uh, us about the possibility of developing a Charter for Youth program, which has been met with quite a bit of excitement. And a number of people have already said yes. And we already have about a half a dozen, seven, eight uh, young people already signing up. So uh, Paula, I thought it would be a good occasion uh, to bring you on for a few minutes uh, 
following Chloe, just to tell us a little bit about your vision and and uh, what's in store for our Charter for Youth program. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim. And I, I'm just honored to be here and so excited that I'll meet uh, Chloe. I, I have um, played and, and, and sung to uh, your Green Tara song so many times in retreats for women. And uh, it's so healing and so powerful. So to bring to know that we'll be in that energy, I think to to think about the purpose. Um, I just want to go back so we so we can grab that beautiful song of of how how I love you, and if we can imagine, um, you know, parents and youth singing that song together, right? And yeah. at some point, um, as as one of the um, goals or what something driving this right that we have this opportunity um with um with ubiquity with shards to bring parents and teens together at the same time so often it is a unique opportunity and it's it's timing as i built out um my connected future program and worked more and more with teens they are ready for the sacred and we know statistics is telling us they need it they're not getting it anywhere. Um, and when they experience the, you know, the, the, the realness of the interconnectedness of life, because this is going to be all experience, a lot of it experiential, we not in our minds, we're going to be in our hearts and our bodies. Um, they, they unequivocally, they say it reduces their stress. Um, something that um, Peter Mary, who will be involved, I'm sure in some way with the weird is normal, is, is that they know that what they're experiencing, when you tell them what they're experiencing is normal, <laughs> it reduces stress. So mm -hmm. it's, it's something we're weaving this together and it will have um, a, a lot to do with the theme. Music is a beautiful entry for uh, youth and bringing them together because it is experiential, it's active. Um, it's something that's needed and finding the voice, feel comfortable with voice is a big uh, part of that. Um, also being embodied, that they're in flow and aware and aligned with their body. We know that just, you know, the social media aspect of, of teens lives and what it's doing to their, to their minds and to the heart. So bringing them into on their body, understanding internal processes, aware of the external, external forces that are shaping them. Um, there's someone very excited to bring into the program. I won't mention his name because we don't, you know, but he has a program called DOSE. And I really, it's, he works with teens. He's very powerful. And looking at those four hormone, hor hormones of, of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, right? Um, the endorphins and how social media impacts them and how it is working against them and how they can come into those natural rhythms. Part of the program is going to be introducing you to the natural rhythms of their bodies and externally external forces and how when we come into rhythm, so I love the music theme, when we come into rhythm and flow with the external and the internal our health, who we are, our, the possibilities is what is so is is expanded beyond, right? So they leave recognizing that they're interconnected and have this ability because it is divine design that we co-create uh, with the universe. And um, there's my own my own timer, so I I don't go over time. Then I didn't realize. And um, so I'm really excited. We have, we, we feel we may be 50% of the time together. Uh, so the other 50% is what we're going to be building out that flows in and flows out in a way that's uh, harmonious. And um, what else can I say about it? Any questions, I guess, were um, uh, wonderfully Casper Drummond, who was, I met last, uh, summer is coming on as he's 16 years old. Um, I love the story that at age five, someone walked into his mother's yoga class and he looked at her and said, you really need tiger's eye. <laughs> so Casper is going to be part of our, um, faculty and as well as Colette Coracon is going to be helping us with that. 
And there'll be three or four other faculty that I'm working with to bring in and, and put together a very exciting uh, program. We're gonna create a frequently asked questions uh, within the next couple of weeks. So for parents interested, so grandmothers, grandparents, bringing in uh, grandchildren, opportunity as parents, and uh, we're gonna keep it small. We're seeing this as a pilot and we're going to build this up in a way that um, um, is kind of one nail at a time being a carpenter's daughter. You know, we're gonna put one nail in at the time. We're gonna build this in a, in a way that it's structured um, for sustainability, for, for ongoing programming, uh, both within charts and also uh, within ubiquity. I'm very excited. I'm very honored. I, I love ubiquity. I, from the very first moment that I met Bonache and, and Jim at a retreat in Menla, and I'm counting on, on um, Bonache's uh, participation and the dance and the embodiment and the movement component. I've, I've just very honored and blessed and excited for the youth. I'm very excited for the youth. And we're gonna do pre and post measures. So for the next year, we're gonna be able to tell parents as a result of this program, this is what you're gonna see. And it's gonna be a measure that they can ongoingly go into and, and um, complete and track their own progress. We're gonna create a Sharts Academy that was just for the teens, as well as we'll see what happens with the follow-up. So there's an interconnectedness, ongoing support built into the, into the design. Divine design. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Paula. When Paula and I were talking about it the other day, we were talking about the possibility of a Jedi school, you know, because we want the young people really, as we've been exploring on humanity rising, to tap their extraordinary hidden potential. And there's very simple techniques that en enable all of us to connect with the force. And so uh, we have a lot of uh, very uh, big plans and are wanting to just invite all of you uh, to be in touch with Paula. Uh, we'll be having a communication uh, over the next uh, week or so uh, to everybody in the Wisdom School and the Chartres Human Humanity Rising uh, community about what we're doing. And in that spirit, I wanna make one uh, very important announcement uh, and that is that um, last month we announced that we were going to have Chartres and then a post-Chartres pilgrimage to mystical Paris with Andrew Harvey. Uh, that's now not taking place. Andrew has been to India. He got caught up, as we all know, uh, Andrew can, made other plans, came back and said, listen, I, I, uh, I, uh, uh, he's moving to India. So uh, he's starting to shift his great tectonic plate eastward. Uh, and um, uh, so what we're gonna do is something just as good, if not better. We're gonna go down to the caves of the Dordogne. Those are the sites of the Lascaux and the ancient caves, some of which are older than Lascaux that go back 30, 40,000 years into the human Neolithic past. And I've been there several times, and I, I will tell you, as well, anyone who's been to the caves, it's an experience like you've never experienced before when you go down into the earth and look at the art that's on the caves. Mm -hmm that in many cases were painted 40,000 years ago and then covered up and have only now come to the light of day in the last 20 or 30 years. And some of the caves that we'll visit are on private property and they haven't been refurbished. You just go down into them like they were found. And so we're gonna go with Apila who's been going to the caves for probably as long as we've been going to Chartres and uh, has a deep network there uh, with people who know the caves intimately. We know the farmers uh, that have the special caves that aren't even open to the public. 
Uh, and um, so uh, we'll be uploading that syllabus literally in the next couple of days. But uh, Paul, I, I can, can't imagine a deeper spiritual experience than for the young people, along with the adults, to go down into the caves uh, after going to Chartres and uh, deepening their awareness. Uh, and even in the past, we've done oming and, and chanting in those caves. Uh, that would be extraordinary, uh, Chloe, just to do your seven sounds of love in a cave, you know, that was painted 40,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, in one of the caves, by the way, one of the caves that you'll see, because it was covered up for like 30,000 years and then uncovered, you can still see where the shamans would sit as they presided over the ceremony. And to go into that seat and then have them close the mouth of the cave. Mm. So you're sitting in complete and utter darkness, knowing that you're sitting on the seat of the ancient shamans. Wow. Is a profound experience and so um i would love to share that with uh with the young people and with the adults and again we're going to be putting the syllabus up in the next couple of days uh, we're making the arrangements now i bet i just wanted everyone to know that after chartres next year it will not be paris it'll be the dordogne and the uh, neolithic caves so thank you paula uh, thank you uh chloe uh, is there any comment that you'd like to make uh, Banafshe as we close out maybe give us a blessing yes I'd love to say um, happy holidays to everyone blessed holy days and may you be carried on the waves of love and may you be open to let the waves of love move through you and bring more peace and harmony to our world especially in places like Iran, Ukraine, and everywhere else that it's needed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much love to each and every one of you. See you next year. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you, Paula. It's going to be a wonderful 2023. Bye, everyone. See you next year.